Welcome to Extension Connection on Super Talk 1270. Thoughtful information and discussion with experts from both Burley and Morton County Extension Service offices. Extension Connection provides advice on family nutrition, issues in agriculture, lawn and garden, community leadership, homeowner concerns, and so much more. Live from the Super Talk 1270 studio, this is Extension Connection. Welcome to the Extension Connection. Today you have the Burley County Extension staff visiting with you. Myself, Ashley Stegman, the Ag and Natural Resource Agent, and then Tom. Tom Kelv, our horticultural specialist here today. And we are live in the studio, so we are um, ready to answer any of those questions that you have. Again, the number is, Jim, you're going to have to help me out, 667, 663-1270, of course, 1270. All right. And uh, one thing I really noticed is, is the weather. Yeah, it was a dramatic change. It hit. It, it was. was wonderful going from a hundred down to seventy, just like that. And it's it's been a very pleasant week, and uh, <laughs> I think our lawns are much happier this week. And a lot I of our gardens think were so too. a lot of scorching and sun burning oh, in yeah. our landscapes. But so it seems like uh, we turned a page, and now sad to say maybe summer's coming to an end oh i don't like to hear autumn. that oh really but i don't i School don't like to starting yeah soon. i know I've, I've seen a lot of pictures posts on facebook there's a lot of schools that are already starting today or today today yeah <laughs> yeah i have uh, about wow. five or six uh friends moms of mine um that posted pictures of sending their kids on the bus this morning so it's a good feeling, I guess. <laughs> you know, I, I'm afraid that when the day comes, my my little guy just turned oh, yeah. four yesterday, oh, yeah. and so it's I'm nice. afraid that the when the day comes, it's not going to be that easy. Oh really? Uh, maybe maybe when yeah, he gets older. Know. You just never. Know I'm sure actually. when he gets my older, it'll like be better. It. Maybe you just have to have a a miserable summer vacation, and yeah. then they'll they'll look forward to okay. school. Okay, getting back that. and yeah, visiting don't make all their friends. So fun, you know. <laughs> Make them want to go back to school. Oh, see yeah. All their buddies again. So All right. So. Well, with um, the talk of school right around us, we also are going to be starting a new 4-H year. And so I just want to remind any of those listeners that are interested in 4-H, um, we have a 4-H extension agent, Amelia Dahl. And if you have any questions relating 4-H or finding a club or joining, please contact our office and talk to her. Our number there is 221-6865. And to start off the new 4-H year, which begins technically September 1st, we are going to be having a little um, event out at Minokin Grove. And we are going to have a a 4-H Fall Fundraiser Festival. And so there we will actually, it's kind of new. I know Jim and Tom were talking here earlier about running a marathon. Well, here's your opportunity, boys. We're doing a 4-H 4K. So that was a virtual marathon we were talking oh, about. Oh, virtual. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm sorry. All right. Well, <laughs> if you are interested and if you are a runner, um, a 4K, it's it's not quite as long as your 5K. It's a little bit shorter. Um, we yeah. do welcome run run or walk. Everybody's um, invited to participate in, in this. And this event will actually be happening August 3rd. 30th. Um, we will be out at the Minokin Grove, and this, um, that location is just east off the interstate um, at the McKins, uh, at the Minokin exit. Um, and if you are wondering how you sign up, you can definitely call our office or you can register online, which that URL is too long, so I'm not going to say that on yeah, air. Just Google. But just Google um, Extension Office. Yeah, and you'll be able to find the information right there. So the event starts, uh, we're doing registration from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. The race starts at 9 a.m. It probably will, depending on how fast or, or slow you run or walk, um, we're, we're allotting about an hour to an hour and a half for that race. So it'll be nice, um, nice morning run out in the country, which, um, you know, I, I'm not a sprinter nor am I a distance runner, but I do like to go for a little jog. So that'll be a, a great event. Um, we'll have games starting at 1030 
And then we will also have a lunch um, served by Mitzi Johnson and their 4-H club out there. And that will be a free will donation lunch. So come on out. Uh, We'll be having Sloppy Joe's salad and chips at 1130. And then, of course, there's going to be games to open to the public. Um, So if you have any uh, kids that want to get out and do something, come on out. We've got games, archery planned. And then, uh, you know, the the Grove is is a great place place to take some of those um, nice family fall pictures. We'll ha- we have a, a lot of trees out there that will be changing in color. And so that would be a great time for you to get those family pictures taken. And then, of course, um, what other fall festival needs is a hayride. And so we'll have hayrides there, good. too. So it's going to be a, a great event that will be out at the Minokin Grove on August 30th. Open and that, to everybody. That is open to H. everyone. Yes, everyone. Right. Open to the public. Um, and again, free hayride. Free, free hayride. And archery yeah. games. Yes. Lots so games. it's going to be a, a fun time. Now yeah, that uh, 4K, there is registration that um, you can register online, like I said, uh, $25 per person. Uh, if you're after August 21st, then it goes up to $35 per person. And all the, the, the money that's being fundraised at this event is going to be going for some improvements out at the Minokin Grove. Um, they're going to be building a, a new restroom facility out there and then also some some funds will be going to uh, the Louise Gobbs Playground um, fundraiser for a playground out at our office. So that is a that's great good. event that's going to be happening. Another thing, um, if if you're looking to do some volunteer work and maybe you're you're tired of being in your yard in your garden, but you want to do something because uh, you just you're an avid gardener. Uh, The Bismarck Community Orchard, which was planted by volunteers um, last May, the end of May, there's, uh, I believe, over 130 plants that were planted. Um, They are looking for some help because they're they're looking for individuals to come out and do some vigorous weeding. And so if you want to weed, we have a lot (laughs) for you to do. So if you are interested in in that, um, please contact Rena Melhoff. um, And she will be kind of lining up the times and the location for those uh, those individuals that want to do some weeding weeding and watering and just some general maintenance on the orchard trees. Um, Like I said, there's over 130. 30 plants planted and unfortunately the orchard had hasn't been um, cared for as well as it probably could have and of course with the hot heat this summer they really need some extra tender love and care going into the fall so again if you're interested in that um, please contact our office uh, 221-6865 or Rena Melhoff uh, and you can find that information on Facebook through the Bismarck Mandan Garden Club. And with that, I believe Jim is giving us the nod. We are going to be taking a break and we'll be right back with the uh, Burley County staff with the Extension Connection. Right now, 63. Get the traffic and weather information you need anytime on Super Talk 1270 and online at supertalk1270.com. Connection again today. You have uh, the Burley County Extension staff visiting with you. My name is Ashley Stegman, Ag and Natural Resource Agent, and then Tom Kelb, our State Horticulturalist Specialist, is also on on the air with me here today. And like I said, we are live in studio. So if you have any questions, please call us in at 663-1270. I know right now a lot of questions come up about. Our gardens, our yeah. lawns, our turfs, yep. all of that interesting stuff. So we will be talking about that. But first, um, because we know all our farmers are, are so busy right now, some starting to harvest already, um, we need to start thinking about what is going, what what we're going to be doing in the future. And for a lot of our producers here in the in the Burley and Morton County areas, uh, wheat is, is the the pick of the crop, if you will, right. I guess. Um, so tips for planting that winter wheat um, in 2015. For those planning on planting that winter wheat this fall, uh, the time to start preparing is now. There are many reasons why including winter wheat into your cropping mix can be a very good choice. There are some challenges 
in producing a good crop. However, the winter kill and the diseases topping the list. The following are some suggestions that might help migrate the risks associated with planting that winter wheat. Um, first, when possible, plant uh, when it's possible, plant winter wheat into a standing stubble. So when I say standing stubble, um, most of the time a lot of individuals will plant that winter wheat into the, the crop uh, stubble that is left from the previous year. Survival of winter wheat during the winter is enhanced when it is covered with snow during the coldest months of the year. Standing crop residues, so that stubble, can effectively retain that snow um, that may fall. Um, tall flax and canola stubble work the best, but um, any erect stubble that will retain snow is recommended. Planting winter wheat into wheat stubble is not ideal for de disease reasons. Um, some Several diseases will actually overwinter through the soil, so you want to make sure that you're, you're following a, a, a good um, crop rotation program or management plan. But as long as the disease management is planned, wheat stubble can be an acceptable residue. Plant your winter hardy adapted varieties. So there are uh, some varieties that are, are more hardy than others. Um, use that winter hardy variety, especially if you're not planning planting into a standing residue because that that standing residue or that stubble is really there almost as a as a as a blanket it kind of um insulation thank thank you tom yes it acts as insulation and so you want to make sure that if you're not planting into uh, already crop stubble you won't get a hardy uh hardy adapted variety some of those of course, our North Dakota crop improvement varieties, Acceptor, Decade, Jerry, Moats, and um, Radiant are all, all varieties that are really, really winter hardy adapted varieties that do really well. So you want to just make sure that the varieties um, that are really developed in Canada and North Dakota are most of the time your best, uh, mo most um, hardy type of varieties. Varieties developed in South Dakota and Montana tend to be intermediate in winter hardiness to those developed in North Dakota or Canada. So make sure that you're getting a variety that will sustain our winters up here. Uh, plant in September. The op Optimum planting date for north for the northern half of the state is September 1st to the 15th and for the southern half of the state would be 15th of, the, of or September 15th to the 30th. In recent years planting during the first 10 days of October have largely been successful. The last practical date that winter wheat can be planted will depend on the weather since there must be enough moisture and growing degree days so that seed can really germinate and the seedlings um, can, can vernalize before by spring. Large seedlings will overwinter better than the small seedlings. Target the earlier portion of the recommended planting date range. So again, you want to keep in mind your weather um, and um, you want to plant one to one and a half inches deep. Seeds about uh, seed about a million seeds per acre. That sounds like a lot of <laughs> seeds, right? <laughs> Yeah. But generally a seeding rate of 900,000 to 1.2 million yeah. viable seeds per acre is adequate because you you put in a lot of seeds like it sounds like a lot of seeds but um you really will only have I, I don't I don't want to be oh. pessimistic but yeah. you could only have half of that really be viable seed actually. So you want to make sure that you're putting enough seed down for it to carry over. Well, those are a few um, tips on planting your winter wheat. Again, you want to avoid the varieties that are not hardy adapted for North Dakota. Um, and then also something that has been a problem within the last year and well, with that in the last couple years is um, scab. And so you want to avoid varieties that are highly susceptible to scab. Scab is not always a problem in winter wheat, but it can be seen. Um, it 
Scab severely affected the winter wheat crop in much of the state in 2014 and in some isolated parts of the state te- of, of the state in even 2015. And so again, knowing your var- varieties, looking at those varieties that are resistant um, for hardiness and scab control are things to keep in mind when you're preparing to plant your winter wheat. With that, all right. So another thing that we're seeing out in the fields lately are our weeds. Really? Not only (laughs) fields, but even in the gardens. Um, You know, even when you're driving along the roads, you're seeing a lot, a lot of weeds. Um, One thing, I guess, as as a kid, I always thought was really, really fun to play with which I'm sure oh, my really? dad was not happy with. but um, Playing with weeds? Yeah, really? that foxtail barley. You know how you... you <laughs> well, I got a you, lot in my property. Too. You just can, you know, it's so soft and, yeah, and really fluffy, how it kind of just waves in the wind. In the wind you know, yeah. I thought that was the coolest stuff growing it, up. It, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm from Minnesota and I you know, like near the Twin Cities. And okay. I never really saw that before I came here. And it is, okay. it is an impressive weed, I have to say. I, you know, it's, the I'm not. seed head, it's all like light colored mm-hmm. and um, it just blows so nicely with fluffy tops. And yeah. uh, you see it a lot in the Bismarck Manning area and some of our newer subdivisions. Mm-hmm. You know, they're, uh, it's kind of, it can take tough conditions, some mm-hmm. uh, disturbed soils. And so you see, it, you can see it, and uh, it's 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 not really a hardy perennial, but uh, it can it does have some survival to it. And it can reseed itself actively, so it's kind oh, of yeah. interesting. Yeah. So what do you recommend about it? Just in play with it, or well, so no, probably shouldn't. Uh, you know, for some of the kids, maybe it maybe it's <laughs> something to it play be with. And it a could be bouquet, ornamental. You know? That would look it's nice. You know, nice. Um, just maybe talking about that, my. Um, last week actually was uh, my husband and I's anniversary, yeah, and sure. he was nice enough to get me um, a bouquet of flowers. And he got um, he ordered them through Crab Apple. It's a, a floral yeah, there sure. on Maine, and he had to go in and pick the different flowers. They let him really? pick, That's nice. which Personal. you know that that Fox is nice. Barley? But he said, "I don't, I don't pick flowers. I don't oh. know what she likes. Oh. Just, just something pretty. Find you some do it." On the road. So he's kind of a. He knows his weeds. He knows his grasses. You know, he kind of knows that stuff. And he goes, I couldn't believe it. They had thistle. They had thistle to put in a flower arrangement. And so he. Flower of Scotland. You know, you know, it can be pretty in everybody. It depends on (laughs) the eye of the beholder. You know, that's kind of how it goes. So back to this foxtail barley. At times of the, at this time of the year, we're probably seeing it a lot along the roads, in the ditches, even in the fields. Um, You know, one thing that you you need to know, I guess, is it's a grass weed um, and growers not remembering the the location of the foxtail barley from last year and growers not knowing effective control measures make this weed very prolific. So, you know, you kind of have to look where where is this growing and, and how can I manage that? So the question is, what chemical options will control foxtail barley in rangeland, pastures, and, and non-crop areas? Uh, if these areas do not contain a desirable grass species, uh, there is a chem- chemical, a product called Select or Assure, that can be applied to plants in the tiller stage, especially before that plant heads out. And then you'll have your most successful um, chance at controlling it. If the area contains desirable grass species, um, then Plateau, which is a, a chemical that um, can that is labeled to control your foxtail barley. It's important, no matter if you're you're applying in the field, in the ditch, or in your garden, that uh, you are following that label uh, according to its instructions. So the proper timing, the uses, the the recommended adjuvants, and again, really follow that label if it tells you that. There's a, a temperature, you know, you're not supposed to be spraying any type of herbicides or pesticides, you know, when it's above 80 degrees, yep. you better not yep. be doing that because you're not going to have an effective, effective way with that. So your foxtail, it's an annual grass, uh, will die from frost. So 
there will be an end in sight for it. That's the green fox tail. Yeah, the green and fox that tail. Has a, that, I think a lot, that's pretty common right now. It's very active, and that the head is it's not so fluffy. It, mm-hmm. it actually does look like a furry fox tail, and it's primarily green in color. And that's an annual, right? Yep. It's on. I and call that's it death row. It's that's, not a death row. It's you know, got like 30 days to live. Okay. And that's the one I remember it. as a kid playing with all the time, pulling the seeds oh, out and throwing right? them. Yeah, okay. And right. I think that's why my mom and dad got so mad at me. That's right. You were just you were yeah. shattering the seeds, spreading them everywhere in the yeah. garden. But that's an annual grass. Those. That's the whole key. So there's no need to be spraying for foxtail. And that's just an annual. Mother Nature will kill it. Same with crabgrass. That's an annual. Frost will kill it. All the crabgrass in your yard today will die. <laughs> well, that's Mother that's Nature. good to know. There so go. don't if, let her go to seed though. Yeah. Keep mowing. Yep. It. So if you have any of that green foxtail or crabgrass, just know the frost will kill it. Okay. Yeah, keep mowing. All right. It looks like we are going to be taking a break here and. We will have a few messages and we'll be right back with Extension Connection. Right now, 63. Get the app called Radio Pup for your iPhone and take us everywhere you go. Biz Market Man Dan's own Super Talk 1270. Welcome back to the Extension Connection. Today we have the Burley County Extension staff visiting with you. My name is Ashley Stagman, the Ag and Natural Resource Agent. And then we have Tom Kelb, our state horticulturist specialist that is um, in our office visiting with us also. So we've we've covered quite a bit already today. Yeah, a lot of good stuff about crops, <laughs> weeds. Oh, yes, those pesky weeds. Some of your weeds. favorite plants. Oh, yeah. Well, now I know childhood better. Childhood memories. My childhood <laughs> memories, yes. Yep. <laughs> Oh, yes. 4-H. Oh, yes. What else you got going on there? All right. Well, um, this fall, we are going to be starting again. Um, there, There's a research project going on about or with um, soybean cyst nematode. And so we're going to be starting a sampling program again. Uh, the North Dakota Soybean Council has agreed to pay for the costs of um, the soil samples attained. Uh, what we would do is we would go into a soil uh, to a soybean field and take soil samples to see if that cyst nematode, which can be very um, devastating on your crop, your yields, um, if that has uh, moved over. Um, into kind of our our more western states. Now, um, the cyst nematode has been found in a few counties on the eastern edge of the state. Um, We have yet to really have a significant number here um, farther west as you move since we don't have a lot of soybean fields um, farther west. Here, um, kind of in the central state, we're seeing more, more and more soybeans being planted every year. And so if you are interested in getting some soil samples done on your property, at, um, at, in your, on your farmland, please um, let me know. Contact me. That's Ashley Stegman at our Burley County Extension Office, 221-6865. And again, the samples um, would be paid by the Soybean Council, and we would be able to share that information with you on what type of soils you have in your field and and maybe make some recommendations of um, what uh, nutrient management needs to be done in, in your fields there. So that's another opportunity just letting letting everyone know about. So they can get a free soil sample, it sounds like, and they'll yes. test for the cyst nematode at the same time yes. for a soybean grower. Yep, yep, that no is correct. there's no charge. There is no charge. So it Sounds like a good deal. That's a very, very good deal. Why not? <laughs> exactly, Why not right? Why what enemy you've got in the ground? You that know, is find out your right. Nutrition. It's, yep. That is correct. And so one one last thing, I guess, um, you know, there's when I'm out on house visits, we have a lot of house visits about trees. That's right. Get a lot of questions on it. trees. Um, and one thing I think that or that I have been noticing um, is the type of mulch that you pick for your tree. Um, yes. And and I know Tom, your feelings on that rock mulch already. You're not, you're not a fan mulch? of that. Yes, rock is a four-letter word that cannot be spoken. 
<laughs> All right. Nothing good about it. It is not recommended. It traps that heat and creates that leaf scorch. Yes, it does. Um, it weighs it it weighs that will Compacts. compact the yep. soil. Yep. Um, the the jagged edges can damage that tree bark even. Yeah, it's not that. And it and just I looks good. But yeah. The plants. If you really felt for your plants, <laughs> if you had a relationship with that shrub, you go. You would hear its pain. You would its hear suffering. its sadness, right? Oh, so there's got to be something <laughs> better than rock mulch. That's that's true. What do we got? Um, shredded bark mulch. Sounds great. Um, that would be better. That conserves the soil moisture, prevents that extreme soil temperatures, because that's another thing you think about your rocks. It is really just a you know a, a heating trap that's right. for them. It has no very little insulation value at mm-hmm. all compared, especially compared to the shredded bark. Oh yeah. And that shredded bark will also reduce that winter inner, um, injury, enhance your yep. soil fertility, and it protects against lawnmowers. That's right, because <laughs> every time you start the lawnmower, every tree in your yard shudders in fear. Oh, no. Because lawnmowers are the biggest killers It's kind of, of their trees. silent cry, you say? <laughs> you, yeah, that's right, exactly. <laughs> I say, because the most precious tissue of a tree is just beneath the bark. Okay. And when you try to get the turf around your tree and you scrape that bark, you can cause long-term problems. So that's maybe one of the best. Maybe I can think of that's the only thing good about rock mulch is it keeps the lawnmower away from the plants. Okay. But besides that, it's just like a slow torture. <laughs> and it doesn't blow away. That's what people say, too. Okay, that won't blow away, but sometimes shredded bark will. I, I question that. But Yeah. But then how about... The proper way to mulch is like okay. I like shredded bark mulch. I just it's just so wonderful for the plant. It's just so good on every level. It's just especially like you know like hot summer like we had moisture. It's always such a concern here in North Dakota, and that mulch conserves moisture. That really makes such a big difference. But now there's different ways to mulch, right? There's, mm-hmm. You want to talk about that? Yeah, first, sure. Right? So um, it's it's really recommended to apply that mulch, um, that shredded bulk. B- a bark mulch, excuse me, um, in a circle at least three feet wide, the wider the better. Remember, we're trying to um, increase that, protect it against our lawnmowers, and then I'll cr- increase that soil moisture and yes. really hold in that moisture for that tree. Yes. Um, mulch should be minimal near the trunk and gradually increase to four inches around the outer rim of that mulch. If mulch is heaped near the trunk, it will cause the trunk it will cause tr- trunk rot and encourage yep. rodents to nest nearby. That's right. Don't we call that volcano mulch oh. piles? Is when you build up the mulch near the trunk, and like you say, that, that leads to trunk rot. And that is a great place for a meadow mouse to spend the winter. And they just they sit insulated in that shredded bark and they just nip on that bark whenever they get hungry. So And don't I do that. I am not a fan of any type of rodent. Oh, so really? no. Mm. I will make sure it's that of I do not one. Yep. I do not have the Mickey that mouse. in my tree. Yeah, Mickey, Mickey Mouse, Mouse, Minnie Mouse, Mouse I can handle them, but <laughs> not with pesty eyes. Yeah, no, not right. for me. So one other thing I was yeah. going to visit with, um, last night, as I said, it was my son's birthday yesterday. So we were outside, and I noticed a, a couple, a, quite a few wasps, more yep. than I had <clears throat> previously. Right. So wasps um, get more aggressive as the population soars into August. I didn't know that. Yeah, they're, uh, you know, a wasp nest starts brand new every year a pregnant queen wakes up from the winter sleep and she starts a new nest so it starts with you know no nest and it just keeps building up exponentially so some wasp nests this time of year can have literally thousands oh, of wasps in them and they get more competitive and their food sources decline in nature and they're more likely to come to us for food and they are aggressive so that's a that's a real big concern about how to manage either a, a hornet nest or a yellow jacket nest. Now, I guess with that, how if if you find that you have a nest, um, you know, what are what are you supposed to do with it? How do you get rid of it? Okay, well, you know, the first thing 
Okay, the first thing to deal with is, yeah, if you got a significant wasp problem, you got to find that nest because that's the source of the problem. That's where the queen is, and again, it's just it's just growing exponentially. So we got to find where the nest is, and a wasp nest is very active during the day. You'll see a lot of, uh, you know, hundreds of bees go, or not bees, definitely wasp, I should say, going back and forth. So you, if you identify the nest, let's say it's in a tree, that's uh, often a bald-faced hornet nest to be in the tree. So then actually what we got to do is you got to figure out, <clears throat> again, you know, the frost is coming in a <laughs> month. You can just let it go because what happens is all the wasp, except for the smart queen, she'll head out the night before the, the frost comes. She's, she just, she's a two. She knows. She, can she knows tend. what's going she's, on. She She'll go for it. shelter. <laughs> but most of the other wasps are just stupid and they're just going to get blasted. <laughs> and so... You could just let that happen naturally, okay. and, that, the, and, the, and that nest will be destroyed over winter. It won't be ever used again. So if it's not in a hazardous area, you can just leave it alone. But if it is in a hazardous area, you got to go after it. And the way you go after it is you got to know your enemy. And they're all going to be there at night, so we're going to go, go after them at night. They're all in the nest, secluded, there at night, and then we're going to pick a cold night. They're less likely to fly when the temps are in the 50s or colder. So pick a cool night. And then, you know, you're going to scope it out during the day. Okay, that's the hole of the nest. That's where I'm going to target my spray. I'm going to go get a knockdown spray that can shoot, let's say, 20 feet or farther. They're available at the hardware store. And I'm going to target that spray right at that hole. But I'm going to do it at night. And, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to respect my enemy. <laughs> I'm not going to sit there and play, say, hey, how you doing, everybody? I'm not going to work. I'm going to say, hey, how, you want to go get me? I'm going to get you. No, you, just, <laughs> you say, okay, you just go there. I got my can of spray, and it's nighttime. Temps are cool. I wear protective clothing, especially, you know, protect your hair too. A lot of times wasps can get in your hair when they mm -hmm. come out and shoot it right in there. Just soak that nest, and then you just get the heck out of there. And then the next day you see how successful you were and because they'll be going in and out of the nest if they survived. And you might have to go after them the next night, but usually that's it. Now, is it true to, do wasps come, can they nest in the ground? Yeah, there are some nests like the German yellow jacket. A lot of, a lot of wasps will nest in the ground actually. Hmm. And so you got to do the same thing. You got to find out where you're, where that enemy headquarters is <laughs> and we're going to find it during the day and then i'm going to know exactly where it is and then i'm going to go and i'm going to i'm going to go after it. you can use the same knockdown sprays if you want but oftentimes what people use is seven dust it's a very common insecticide and wasps are very sensitive to it and if you use a dust they're very likely to come into contact with it so you just go there and you like maybe get a, a plastic disposable cup of the seven and you just you just again same thing you know your enemy you wait till night cold night you go right up to that nest sprinkle that dust in there and hightail it out of there and then again chances are you're, you're going to be successful and then that's the end of that particular nest and the queen the queen's in there she's going to get exposed to it because the workers are going in and out they're likely to come into contact with that seven dust and we got it under control but we usually do that if we feel it's a hazardous nest and do it do it you know as soon as you see it because again the populations are soaring also keep your garbage cans you know tightly sealed that makes a difference if you have an outdoor picnic you know watch your soda can you know make sure you keep it covered so you don't have an unpleasant surprise when you take a drink of pop oh that would just be horrible yeah we, I've, I've had it happen to me that's oh, why i'm no. reminding you don't do it don't do <laughs> what right. i did all <laughs> yeah, right they're dangerous they're very dangerous okay well from Tom, make sure that you cover your pop cans or any other drinks that you have outside. And with that, we are going to be taking a break and we'll be right back with Extension Connection. Right now, 66. Our own radio station. Not Fargo, not the Twin Cities. Proud to be Bismarck and Mandan Zone, Super Talk 1270. Welcome back to the Extension Connection. Today you have the Burley County staff visiting with you. My name is Ashley Stegman, the Ag and Natural Resource Agent, and then we have Tom Kelb, our State uh, Horticultural Specialist. And as I said, we are live today in the studio, so if you do have any questions, please call right on in. Our number here is 663-1270. So something that we were um, discussing during break was those 
white uh, butterflies that we've been seeing so often. That's right. Technically, moths. Moths. Okay. Please. Sorry. They're moths. <laughs> they're moths. A lot of people do call them that's, butterflies. That's right. But yes, they are <clears throat> moths. Yeah, they're everywhere. And and what so, are these? I know last week I, I yeah. saw a lot. This week, yeah. not so not much. so many this week. So I don't know what the see what change ha- pro- is. Well, I think that 100 degrees probably. The weather probably. probably didn't appreciate that 100 degree temperature yeah. and those brisk winds. But. I don't think a lot of people um, like that 105 <clears throat> degree weather we had, but you know. We have air conditioning. The cabbage moths <laughs> don't have air conditioning yet. So, they don't. So they can, you know, they live a short life anyhow. They have a... The imported cabbage worm is the most common uh, white cabbage moth we see, and it, and it has lots of generations per year. It can have three to five here in our state, and they can occur more than. There's a lot of things happening in that cabbage path patch. There's a lot of eating. There's a lot of uh, breeding going on there. They're flying around there, laying a lot of eggs, and so there could be even more than one generation occurring at its, at the same time. You know, you can have the the larva eating lots of stuff now while your cabbage making stripping your cabbage or your broccoli or kale and you can you know when you whenever you start seeing the dance of the white cabbage moth that's when you got to take action and so like we're even we're way past that stage if you see uh, those green cabbage worms um, you got some options the best You can either just uh, let it go naturally and more protein to your diet there, (laughs) eat them that way. Most people aren't into that, though. So then we can go after, and I I call this like, you know, there's different ways to control pests, and one is the the Clint Eastwood Dirty Harry approach. (laughs) Like, I see that pest. It's it's eating my cabbage, and I I don't like that. So You're not welcoming. You're not putting the welcome welcome mat mat down for it. I want sweet revenge is what I want. (laughs) And so I'm going to use a contact killer. And so the most common one that's used in gardens is seven S E V I N, or car, chemicals carbaryl. And there's it's widely available, and it will kill the cabbage. Uh, it'll kill the cabbage worms on contact and give you seven to fourteen days of protection. Usually one spray is enough to handle it. And but then you know it's a it's a toxic chemical and you got to be really careful around that. I generally not too crazy about that on my food stuffs. Um, and so you got to follow the label, and there'll often be a seven day waiting period, depending on the crop, seven to fourteen days with carbaryl for that type of a crop. So follow the label carefully and don't harvest, don't eat any of that broccoli, for example, that they might be going after, and you'll, you'll be harvesting now cabbage. We can just let that go for a while. It's you know. A lot of times we harvest that after a light frost anyhow. So if you want to go the, the safer route, there are safer chemicals we can use. And especially for the the younger caterpillars, we can use BT products. And that would include Dipel, spelled with a D, or Thuricide, spelled with a T, Thuricide. And they will kill young caterpillars. And what happens is they spray them, and the caterpillars will eat this natural bacteria, and then they'll die of a stomach ache two days later. So some people who hate bugs prefer that kind of death, a slow, torturous two-day death of stomach (laughs) ache and death. So maybe that's the way you get your revenge that way. You know, actually, there's another chemical out there that's really uh, getting a lot of people happy. And that's called Spinosad, Spinosad, and there's different trade names. One is Entrust, Entrust, E-N-T-R-U-S-T, Entrust, and uh, Monterey is a garden, Monterey Garden Spray. But Spinosad, it's another bacteria. It kills on contact, and also it has some action when it's ingested. So it's really effective, very safe. It's just, it's a... It's a soil bacteria that they found in a abandoned rum distillery in the Caribbean. Hmm. And people are using it like crazy now and because it's safe and very effective, very effective against this pest. <clears throat> and, you know, the one thing about it, it's so effective and being used so much, the company is thinking about stopping its production because it's being used so widely that they're worried that the insects are going to develop resistance to it. Okay. So, but that's a, it's a great tool, especially against not only these cabbage worms, but 
this spotted wing drosophila, which has infested our North Dakota now the last few years here, and here in Burley and Morton counties. You know, those are those white worms you see inside your raspberries now. That's from a fruit or a vinegar fly, kind of a fruit fly that later eggs into that, and those eggs are hatching. And spinosad is the chemical of choice to go after that because it's safe, and you can spray it, and then you can go harvest soon afterwards. So spinosad's a great tool for gardeners. Be aware for that. And uh, <clears throat> another product that people can use that's fairly safe is a permethrin product. That's an organic product, permethrin, and the chemical. Most common trade name is pyganic, and that can also control these cabbage worms and mm. spotted wing drosophila. Even, even neem can help against the cabbage worms, but it takes a few days to work. So you've got a lot of options to go after those cabbage moths. It really helps to go get it as soon as you see those white moths dancing because they're dancing and laying eggs, and you've got to get them as soon as possible. Because larvae have a big appetite. Did you know that? Like, you saw a hornworm come into our office yes. about a yep. week ago. And a hornworm will eat four times its weight every day. Oh, so my goodness. It, you know, that's, cabbage worms have gigantic appetites, too. So just, you know, trying to get an imagination for what that's about. That's like like, like if you got a 150-pound teenager, mm -hmm. let's say. That's like having, like, what is it, 600 Big Macs. Oh, my goodness. 600 Big Macs <laughs> one day. And then uh, at 600, not six. So that's wow. a, what I call a major Big Mac attack. And then, of course, they, go, they don't want to have a balanced diet, so they'd have 600 large orders of fries. Oh, boy. And then 100 side salads and 100 ice cream cones for dessert. That's each, each teenager, each day. Wow. And, of, of course, you got to have some ketchup to go with that. So let's throw in a 1,000 packets of ketchup to go with that each day. As a so. parent, I really don't <laughs> want to pay that food bill. <laughs> but no. you get an appreciation for their amazing diet <laughs> yeah? that some of these, that's, that's these larvae have. That's it's, very impressive. That's right. That's why, you know, like, you could, it's just they can be so devastating. And so that's why it's so important to go after these guys as soon as possible. And those BT products are very affordable, but you gotta you gotta hit those pests when they're young. That's what it's all about. So what else you want to talk about as far as pests go? Uh, well, look you for know, those Colorado potato beetles—they're starting to show up on our potatoes. I see a little bit of that going on now. Be careful of that. Yeah. Um, I know in in my garden, yeah. um, of course. My husband was a little concerned with all the hot, the heat last yeah. week and everything. We had a lot of leaf roll on our tomatoes, That's which right. is normal because the yeah, hot heat. But, you know, um, his thought was, well, we need to water more and more and more to make sure. I I didn't do that. Oh, no. Because I thought, to well, it'll be husband. fine. <laughs> so they still look a little, yeah, they're but, bent up. But, no, I mean, that's that not going to hurt the fruit no, production. That's a... That's a it's a, it's a physiological leaf roll, they call it, and the leaves just curl upwards, and they say it's a way to conserve moisture. But you don't see any browning there, nope. and uh, like there's no insects hiding in there. And so it's just, it's natural. It's not going to reduce the yield, and there's really nothing you can do about it, really. Once it happens, pretty much that's it. And so just don't worry about it. Just don't worry. But worry about those other things going on with your tomatoes, like those amazing blights that are going active now on tomato vines and like cucumbers and squash vines so mm -hmm. please you know like it's important to water across but do not overhead don't use overhead sprinklers on your on your cucurbits or your tomatoes this time of year you're just going to be spreading disease that way and only water in the morning never water at night this time of year you're just again this is how the diseases go nuts and uh Try to get as much life as you can out of those tomatoes and out of those cucumbers. Try to get mm -hmm. as much harvest as you can because we all know that the Jack Frost is going to be visiting it's us before we knocking know Knocking on the door, I feel. I think it could happen. It's wor I'm kind of worried. Wait, I think we got a month still. but I, I hope so. And make sure <laughs> yeah. that you tell your spouse, if you turn on the sprinkler for the garden yeah. or you know, are, are watering the flowers, make sure you tell them that the water's on. That way... You're, you don't have to drive back home just to turn oh, the sprinklers yeah, off because, 
you know, you don't want to flood your garden. That's not, we don't need that right now. That's right. And most gardens need about an inch of water a week, depending on the situation. You can just set out a cup and let the sprinkler go. Set up a few cups and then monitor how long it takes for your sprinkler to put one inch of water in that cup. Use it as your base time. All right. Well, with that, uh, we are going to be signing off again. That was We were the Burley County Extension staff visiting with you, and we will be back in two weeks. Thank you for listening.